Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpoli from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. It's great to have you all along here today. Our special guest is David Rosenblatt and today we're going to be talking about foodborne worms. Uh, good day David, how are you doing? Fine, doing fine, thank you. Good, good, good. Um, and have you got a bit of sunshine coming in through your window there? I tried to block it off as much as I could. But... No, that's nice. <laughs> I'm giving you a glow. <laughs> right, ladies and gents, say hello in the sidebar. Tell us where you're joining from, as you usually do. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll play the sponsors' ads, and then we'll come back uh, for the presentation. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Thanks to the sponsors. Uh, without further ado, presentation from David. <clears throat> there you go. Okay, so uh, hello to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is David, and I want to thank you for joining us for this webinar. I especially want to thank Simon for giving me the opportunity of sharing my experience and my knowledge with this uh, enthusiastic group. It, it really is important for me. I've been uh, dealing with food safety for the nearly 30 years, and the opportunity to share knowledge is, uh, for me, an honor. Uh, and without these types of platforms, it's much more difficult. Recently, I looked, and uh, over 80,000 views of my YouTube Food Safety Friday videos from the last few years have been uh, have been watched 80,000 times which means that the knowledge is spreading and we're making food across the globe safer for everybody, and that's why we're all here. So that's pretty exciting. Today we're going to be talking about foodborne worms, a subject that is discussed less seldomly, 
uh, it has an enormous impact on public health and on the, and the, the safety of our food supply. So I'm just going to go on and start my presentation. Okay, so the worms or helminths, as we call them in veterinary medicine, are part of the biological hazards that we deal with, along with the bacteria, viruses, single cell parasites, and uh, the prions that are responsible for transmissible, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. So we're gonna be focusing today on worms. The foodborne pathogenic helminths are divided into three uh, zoological groups. We have the nematodes, which are the spaghetti-like uh, round worms. You have the cestodes, which are the flat worms or the tapeworms. And there are trematodes, which are, which are flukes. The diseases that are noteworthy include six uh, human foodborne diseases. Nematodes cause anasychiasis, trichinosis, or trichinellosis, depending who you're talking to, and ascariasis. The testodes cause diphlebothriasis and cystic cirrhosis. And I'll be going into detail later because they all, the, the causative agent for cystic cirrhosis also cause teniasis but I'm not going to be going into that disease in depth because it's less important, but it's the same causative agent. And trematodes cause clonarchiasis. I'm not going to be talking about trematodes in this presentation for lack of time. So I apologize to everybody from the Far East who are living countries or working countries where uh, clonarchiasis is a problem. It is a very localized uh, illness. For the lack, for lack of time, oh, I won't be going. I hope I'll have time for the other ones. For lack of time, I'll be talking about that disease. And before I get started, what you see in this picture is not a worm. And I want you to know that. Uh, we often, most often, will get customer complaints in food. That people find worms in their food. This is in chocolate. People find worms. And when I say worms, I mean worms in their salad. And, their, and these are not worms, none of them. They're all insects. These are larvae and for in, from insects. This is a uh, uh, type of flying insect, the moth. That's its larva. So this is not a food safety hazard. It's not a biological food safety hazard. These are physical food safety hazards or quality issues. When we talk about worms, we're talking about the animal <coughs> called a worm. Let me just clear my throat. So this is a worm. And this is a worm in a piece of uh, fish. And this worm causes the first disease we'll be discussing, which is anasychiasis. It's caused by most of the cases of anasychiasis are caused by the parasitic worm anasychiasis simplex. Some cases caused by Pseudoteranova discipients. But <clears throat> there are a few other species that can cause the disease. They're all called anasychiasis. For all the worms we're discussing, I'm going to be using this little infograms that I ripped off the CDC website, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. They have a great website and they have great infographics for life cycles of parasites. And what we see in this overview of the parasitic life cycle of Anasakis is that it starts with marine mammals. Marine mammals have worms. They excrete the ova, the eggs, in their poop, in the water. In the water, these hatch into little larvae. The larvae swim around in the water. They're part of the, of the zooplankton that swim around in the oceans. They get eaten by little crustaceans, and now the crustaceans have worms. Little crustaceans are eaten by little fish. Little fish now have worms. Marine mammals eat the little fish. They become infected with worms. The worm completes its life cycle in the intestine of the marine mammal, dolphins, whales, sea lions, whatever, and this that completes its cycle. We human beings are not involved. Everybody's happy. They all have worms. Nobody's sick, and that's how nature works. We come into the picture, incidentally, when we consume the little fish instead of, cons instead of the dolphin consuming it, we consume it. And then we are, for the sake of the story, we are the marine mammal, but because we are not a marine mammal, we're a human being, 
this is an accidental infection. So you can see that the life cycle ends with us. So it's unfortunate for everybody, for the worm and for the humans that are affected. There are a few of these. When we go through the, the life cycles of different worms we'll be talking about, we'll see that some of them are incidental infections with a human being is the wrong host. And some of the worms, the human being is a is one of the mandatory hosts for the life cycle. So sometimes we're part of the life cycle, sometimes we're not part of the life cycle, we're always being affected. So what happens when people are exposed to fish that contain Anisakis worms? There are three major manifestations of disease. What happens is the person swallows the fish with the worm live. The worm is an adult worm. It's alive. It gets into the throat. It is swallowed, goes into the stomach, and starts making trouble, usually one, two, or three worms, not more than that. There are cases of mass infection, but these are very, very rare. Uh, so what happens is in the gastric manifestation, which is the most common, within 48 hours after ingestion, people start feeling intense abdominal pain. The body reacts to the presence of the worm with terrible pain, nausea, vomiting. The pain mimics appendicitis or some kind of acute uh, stomach ache. People are usually admitted to hospital off an emergency room, and if the if the medical team are aware of the history and the geography, then they can say, calm down, we're going to get the worm out. It may be a worm, they'll look for it, and it may be removed. If they're not, sometimes accidentally they'll go in and do a laparoscopy, a laparoscopy they'll open the stomach to see what's going on and, and cause more damage than the worm can, can cause. In some cases, there are intestinal anisakiasis, which is, uh, presents as a little bit different. It presents with lower abdominal pain, and it will cause intestinal problems that are more delayed. Obstruction, ileus, peritonitis, intestinal perforation. These may need medical intervention, or they may resolve spontaneously. The most rare manifestation of anisakiasis is gastroallergic anisakiasis, where the body reacts as an allergic reaction to the worm. She says hypersensitivity symptoms, urticaria, angioedema, erythema, bronchospasms, and, and often sometimes anaphylaxis, which can result in death, like anaphylactic symptoms of other allergies. So these are the clinical manifestations. The patients also may experience what we call a pharyngeal tickling sensation. As the worm is going down the throat and it's alive and it can be felt, it causes tickling and people will say they feel something in their throat. They'll often cough up the worm and say, oh my God, I, the worm, they'll, they'll see the worm and throw it out or swallow it, but it can be felt often. The treatment for this disease uh, either removes by gastroscopy or surgery if need be. And if not, if there's no intervention, it will eventually burn into intestinal mucosa, eventually disintegrate or expel itself within a few weeks. How prevalent are these worms? Very, more than we think. Uh, nobody knows exactly because it's not a reportable disease. It's not a contagious disease. So the reports often go undetected. One paper written by a veterinarian from Croatia in 2019 is a pretty good job of talking about uh, taking all kinds of articles and seeing all kinds of uh, studies on incidents in different countries with a pretty good picture. Another work done on finding the, trying to understand the prevalence of anisakiasis was done in Fish Parasitology Review in October 2020, not long ago. And we're talking about 20,000 cases worldwide, which is not a lot, but it's not negligible. These are reported cases, so the real number of cases is probably much, much higher. Nobody knows exactly. It could be hundreds of thousands. In one of the studies, a map was, uh, was constructed to see the prevalence of the worms in fish not in human subjects, but in fish, looking at different areas of the world. And this is a, a burden map where you can see the number of fish in different areas. 
that are affected high levels, lower levels, and lowest levels. So it is very, very common in marine life, in many major kinds of fish, in salt water, of course. Um, I want to show you what the worm looks like when people go to gastroscopy. So Simon will help me and put up a video, a short clip. This is a, gastro a, a gas gastroscopy with, with a little camera, somebody complaining of having anastachiasis, and they'll go in and try to take the worm out. Simon, are you there? Can you show me the video? There we go. So this is the upper gastric tract, and the little camera is searching, and then it caught the worm. It's alive and happy, not for long. And now it's that's it on a gauze pad, swimming around, and the person is now fine, no side effects. These uh, worms are often removed by people who want to who assist in making the fish safer. I have a clip here from a workshop that I'll be showing by sharing my screen from a workshop teaching people how to remove the worms from fish. These are fish experts and worm experts, workshop for people. This specific workshop was done for the kosher community uh, in order for fish to be kosher to the highest standards. Worms must be removed even if the fish is, fish is going to be cooked because the presence of worms is considered not kosher even with cooked fish. So it's, an, it's done manually. This is also done in countries where there are anisakis and the fish is going to be used fresh to make fresh fish products like sushi. They'll be manually removed. I'll show you what it looks like by sharing my screen. Screen share on, screen two, share, and I'll show my video. So this is a, a, a salmon. And you can see the worm in the flesh of the fish. And then the person with the, who removes it just takes it out and throws it on the side. And this is done for every piece of fish, taking out all the worms manually, using special tables with light underneath. And it's a specific expertise to remove these worms from the fish. Pretty neat. Go back to my presentation. Simon, how can I see my presentation again? <clears throat> oh, I went back to the beginning. Uh, yes? Sorry about sorry about that, David. I uh, don't know why that happened. I'll skip forward fast. Sorry about that. We'll be where we were in no time. Patience. There's a worm in the chocolate that's not a worm. There's anisakis. Life cycle. Okay. Prevalence. Okay, that's the first movie, the second movie. And let's now we're back to, to the slides. Uh, how do we handle food to prevent disease, which is why we're all here? Cooking and freezing of fish are effective in killing the parasite. And this is true for most worms. This will repeat itself, cooking and freezing. So if we're going to be cooking the fish, just have, and, 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 and on, I, on purpose, I'm not showing you numbers. Uh, thermal process graphs and dose response curves and freezing um, freezing charts because it is specific to each type of food and specific different types of, of worms. And uh, if you are doing a risk assessment and you do want to use a thermal processing or freezing as part of your control measures, then you should refer to the literature, which is abundant and put together a validated system of killing these parasites. One of the things that we that we recommend doing is to remove the entrails of the fish as soon as possible, because what happens is as soon as the fish dies, it knows it's being eaten, 
the worms will migrate from the intestine into the muscle so that they'll be ready to be eaten. And if we take out the intestine fast enough, that'll decrease the amount of worms in the muscle. The second worm I want to talk about is the worm co that causes the disease diphlebothriasis. The worm is most cases are caused by diphlebothrium latum. It is a tapeworm. There are other species that can cause the disease, but definitely the most common is diphlebothrium latum. Here we can see the infogram of the life cycle, and this is a life cycle that we can see just from looking at it from above, that it includes humans as part of the cycle, so we are mandatory in the cycle. The worm cannot continue its life cycle without human beings, and it is shared between the land and the water. So there's water here and land here, and this is a freshwater fish. It is typical of areas where people consume fish near lakes and rivers. And the way it works is the human being ingests the worm. The worm, the uh, tapeworms have a scolex, that's the head. The scolex then attaches itself to the intestine and begins to feed. And as it grows, it adds more and more pieces of tape onto the tapeworm. These are called the prolactids. And as the prolactids grow, it gets longer and longer. In most tapeworms, which are very common, when the oldest prolactid becomes sexually mature, and then it's ready to spread its eggs. It will detach itself from the worm and exit through the anus into the poop. So we'll have the proglottids that will be squirming around and throwing around eggs on the floor after being defecated. Diphlebothriasis acts a little bit differently. It keeps its proglottids. So the pieces of the tape are being kept, and, the, and the, usually you'll find in the feces the eggs themselves, the ova which are then passed, they will end up somehow in fresh water. This happens where human sewage enters fresh water or people go to the bathroom near rivers or in lakes or water. It will be eaten by these little crustaceans, which will be eaten by the little tiny fish, which will be eaten by the bigger fish, eaten by the human being, and the life and the cycle will continue. The striking thing about diphlebothrium is that like all tapeworms, as long as it's a tapeworm in your intestine, you're not really ill. You just have a, a guest that's hanging around and eating off, or eating, eating off of you, a parasite, but you're not getting ill. The problem with the phlebotrium is when the worm gets too long, it becomes present and felt, and it starts using the body's resources, especially vitamin B12. So there's a December 2020, there's a, a very good review that was uh, published in the American Society of Mycology, the ASM journals, about the prevalence of well, the broad tapeworm, the diphlebothrium latu, prevalence all over the world, wherever there's lake and fresh water, lakes and fresh waters, less in, very, in, in Africa, probably because of diagnosis that's not as high as we would expect, so there's no reason for it not to be in this area of the world, but it doesn't matter that 20 million humans are estimated to be infected worldwide at any given time, so a lot of people, a lot of burden for illness. Mostly found in Scandinavia, Baltic countries, North America, Japan, Chile, areas of, of, of Siberia. The worm can grow in length up to 15 meters, which is unbelievable. 10 meters is common, 15 meters is uncommon. There have been uh, reports of even longer worms that have been found. They can survive for years, living inside the person, alongside the person in peace until they start making trouble. The patients will then experience abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, weakness, vertigo, which is also associated with vitamin B12 deficiency. And vitamin B12 deficiency also causes mood changes, and it has neurological causes neurological disorders, which is usually why people are presented to the clinic, trying to figure out what's going wrong with what's going on with them. And if this, if the clinic knows what they're doing, they will be able to identify the presence of the worm. Uh, we have a clip to show what it looks like living inside of a person on colonoscopy. So if you want to show the movie uh, Simon, it's a little short clip. So this is what the worm looks like alive in the intestine. It is enormous. It's like a little monster. And it's just living there. These are the, what we're seeing now is the tape. 
is the proglottids that are attached to each other. So we can go back to the presentation. Food handling, cooking and freezing of fish is a, are effective in killing the parasite. So we only get we only see cases where people consume raw fish, so raw freshwater fish, or in cases where people prepare fish meals or fish dishes that are to be cooked and they taste the fish before cooking. One of the common causes of diphtheriasis is making fish balls or uh, in the in some ethnic groups they have different types of fish balls at one point this disease was called the jewish housewife syndrome because of the popularity of gefilte fish which is a traditional jewish way of making carp from freshwater lakes and the jewish housewife that's why it's not very politically correct now in the old days the the person preparing the fish would taste the fish before putting the fish balls into the water and cooking them thus that person would get sick but also at some point was called the scandinavian wife uh worm so we don't call that that anymore because everybody now cooks and everybody gets sick to the same extent so that's it for the both houses the next worm worth mentioning is the worm that causes the disease trichinosis or trichinellosis depending who you talk to most cases are called by as called by trichinellus spiralis there are other types of, uh, of worm, the trichinosis group that can cause this disease, but most of them are trichinella spiralis. What you see here in this picture, this is a microscopic picture of the spiral, that's why it's called spiralis, in a cyst in muscle tissue waiting to be eaten. If we look at the life cycle, ignore the human being for a second, because human beings are, like in the case of anasychiasis, are incidental victims. The parasite moves from animal to animal through eating meat. So it is the only one of these parasites that is not involved with feces at all. There, are, it's a, the, the, the worm gives birth to live worms. There are no eggs involved. The live worms are born, they hatch from the mother in the intestine, and then they burrow through the intestinal wall into the bloodstream where they swim around in the bloodstream and enlarge them and, 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 and embed themselves in various tissues, mostly in muscle. And then when that animal that's been infected is eaten by another animal, that animal now goes through the cycle, grows the worm, it gets into their muscle, and then it's eaten over again. And there are many, many animals that have cysts of trichinella. Human beings become infected when they eat uncooked meat of an animal that has it in its muscle. And then the same thing happens in the human being. The, the, the cysts are swallowed, digested. Once the muscle is digested, the larvae are released from the cyst. They then mature in the intestine. We have males and females. This takes about a month. The females are about 2.2 millimeters, a little bit bigger than the males. The males are about 1.2 millimeters. They meet, they go to the movies, they get married, they have kids, and the babies are about one millimeter larva. They're the ones that are put into the bloodstream and then insist themselves back in the tissue, resulting in an infected animal. So the, in order to become infected with the trichinella, the person has to eat uncooked meat from an infected animal. That's the life cycle. According to Gideon, about 11 million humans worldwide are infected with trichinella. It is a very important public health disease. It is a reportable disease in all countries. The OIE uh, is the surveillance for the presence of trichinella, which is why we have more information on this worm than other parasites, because of its importance. A great work that was done in 2016 that was published in Food Microbiology by Ali Rostami and his group did a review of infections in human outbreaks from different sources of meat to give us a picture of the animals involved. Most, the vast majority of cases are related to pork, either wild boar or pigs, but any animal almost, 
uh, can be involved. We've had cases with badgers and with wolves and with cats and dogs, cases from eating walrus, cases from a lot of kids who are eating bears, horses, any animal that can be infected. The cases of horses, and there have been some cases in uh, cows and sheep, are uncommon because these are not carnivores. They become exposed in the field accidentally to carcasses of rodents, and they may swallow that, and then they'll be infected, and then it can pass on to human beings. We look at some of the, uh, the species. The spiralis is the most popular, but there are 12 different species that can cause illness. You can see here where they're distributed and the major hosts. There have been cases in reptiles as well. There have been cases in crocodile and in uh, gila monsters and in different reptiles that have been eaten. Most cases are associated, of course, with pigs, wild boars. Many notable outbreaks. I went over the, the recent outbreaks recent. I took outbreaks from 2010 that involved more than 20 people, 20 people and up. Just to get a feeling of the prevalence of the disease, there are many, many more outbreaks that are smaller numbers, unpublished or later or earlier. So you can see Korea 20 in 2010, 23 people in Poland 2011 going down the line. Serbia, a large outbreak in 2015 with 111 people from wild boar. Uh, you see this case in Italy in 2015, and I wrote that the food involved was beef steak tartare. Uh, the beef here is in uh, uh, quotation marks because apparently the person serving this dish was not serving real beef, but beef spiked with pork to save money. Beef is a very, very uncommon source. We've seen a few of these outbreaks of fake beef causing Trichinella. Uh, recently, 2021, a large case in Argentina from chaquinados, which is a type of sausage from pork. When we see the large cases, like the Argentinian case, 232 people in 2018, 170 people here, these are usually commercial cases where a commercial product was prepared in a factory and then it was distributed and we see a wider spread of the disease. The other cases with a few 10, 20, 30, 40 people are usually cases that are associated with a party or a local fair where somebody prepared a wild animal or an animal that had been, uh, that was not slaughtered properly, not cooked properly. Clinical manifestation of trichinosis, the majority of infections are subclinical. Most people will feel nothing. And the development of symptoms will depend on the number of larvae ingested and where they migrate to. So it's very, very, diverse the types of diseases that people get from this the initial signs which is post consumption which are very non specific because this is the feeling of the larva being digested and starting to mature so there's nausea diarrhea vomiting fatigue fever abdominal discomfort sometimes later we'll have headaches chills cough one of the Giveaway signs is periorbital swelling that is uh, around the eye. This is a reaction, an allergic reaction. Joint and muscle pain, pruritus, itching of the skin. These are all the, the immune system reacting allergically to the presence of the worms that are running around the body. Delayed signs. These are two to eight days, neurological deficits, cardiac, respiratory issues, and often and sometimes death, be, depending on where the larva migrated to. If the larva migrated just to muscle, there may be, we'll see the initial signs, allergic reactions, but if they do migrate to neurological tissue or cardiac tissue or respiratory tissue, then we'll see the typical signs and it can cause death. Food handling, thermal treatment and freezing. Same thing with the other worms. Some variants of trichinella are, do not die of, uh, uh, from freezing. They will live in the freezer. These are the rare variants. Trichinella spiralis will be killed from freezing. In that slide that I showed you before, there are little stars next to the ones. If you go back and, and look at it on YouTube, 
uh, on the movie, you'll be able to see the stars next to the ones that are the variants that can resist freezing. So they're very uncommon. Postmortem inspection. Uh, in the old days, this is a picture uh, taken in a Chicago meatpacking plant in 1896. What we see are dozens, dozens of girls, of women with the microscopes. Every single pig slaughtered. The tissue from the diaphragm is delivered to the examination table, and then they do trichinoscopy, looking at it through a microscope to see if you can see the cysts in the muscle of the diaphragm. And then that specific pig will not be used. Today, we still use this technique in some places. Most, it's not 100% effective. Most slaughterhouses where there is concern of trichinella have moved to artificial digestion and stereo microscopy, which is more advanced. And more and more advanced now, we use PCR and uh, molecular uh, methods to identify the parasite in pork and other animals. The next worm I want to talk about it causes a disease called ascariasis or ascariasis, depending on what country you're coming from. And it's caused by most of the cases are caused by a worm called Ascaris lumbricoides. So the first one we talked about, the anasakiasis, was a round worm. And then its friend, Diphilobothium latu, the tapeworm, is a flat worm, a tapeworm. So we have nematode, and then we have a cestode. Trichinella, again, is a round worm. So it is a nematode. And Ascaris is also a round worm. So it is not a tapeworm, it's a round worm. And if you look at the life cycle of this worm, we, for the first time, we see only human beings. This is the only helminthic parasite that we'll be talking about that's worth mentioning that is not a zoonotic disease. It does not have animals involved. It's human-to-human -human contact through feces. And it's a typical uh, fecal-oral disease, but with a twist because of the specific strange and interesting life cycle of the worm within the human body, it can cause a worm burden that requires medical intervention. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it because there are many types of worms that can be found in feces. People become infected with them. A high number of people in the world have worms and it's nothing to be worried about. It's not even considered a foodborne disease, even though you can catch it from food. Ascariasis is different because of the complications associated with the high worm burdens. What happens here is the eggs are in the poop, in the feces. They, they become fertilized while they're in the soil, in the area people go to the bathroom. It could be anywhere on the floor. And then they become uh, mixed up in, the, in soil or stuck to uh, produce, wherever people with poop on their hands touch produce, touch food, and then they're ingested. Once the eggs, the ova are ingested, then the larvae hatch in the stomach, after which they are, they mature into adult worms, just like we saw with trichinella, female and male, they mate. And then the larva, the new larvae are then embedded into the mucosal wall of the intestine and enter into the bloodstream. In the bloodstream, instead of doing what Chikanella did, which is go right to the muscle and wait to be eaten, because this is a fecal parasite, it has to get back into the intestine. In order to do that, it first has to go through the pulmonary system. So through the bloodstream, the worms then find themselves in the lungs. They then migrate through the alveolar tissue, through the lung tissue, up through the trachea into the throat where they are swallowed. So that after they migrate, they, they climb up here, they're swallowed, they find themselves back in the intestine the second time, and now they can mature and, and, and make eggs. And then the eggs will be treated in the feces. So in order for the worm to be able to become a mature egg that can continue the life cycle, it has to go through the intestine twice, once, first time being swallowed, second time being re-swallowed after visiting the pulmonary system. What, the evolutionary drive behind this strange occurrence is a mystery. It is unclear 
why the worm would evolve to do that, but that's what it does. Therefore, the symptoms can also be associated with different stages of the disease. Now, because this happens, it can do it a few times, cause the number of worms in the intestine to grow and grow and grow. So you don't have to eat food that is heavily contaminated in order to, to suffer from every word burden, because once you have the worms, they can do a few rounds inside of your body and cause a very heavy worm burden, which is what causes most of the disease we're concerned with. So it's estimated that one tenth of the world's population is infected with these worms. So we we now have 275 people in watch, uh, watching this webinar. Uh, so 27 of us have Asperger's. This is, this is a, almost everybody has it. Of course, this is an average. In developing countries, the incidence is higher. In developed countries, it's lower, but it is very abundant. Only 85, only 15 percent will have any signs. 85 percent are asymptomatic and don't even know they have the worms. But it is associated with one out of every 200,000 people will die on average, which is 4,000 deaths a year. This has gone down dramatically from when I started learning parasitology, when I was a veterinary student. Back in the 90s, the number of deaths per year was close to 200,000, estimated World Health Organization, and deworming programs and sanitation programs and treating of wastewater has improved the situation enormously. Most infections of subclinical symptoms during the migration of the larva, 10 to 14 days after eating the, the food, will be signs of peritonitis, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, this enlarged liver, enlarged spleen, some pneumonia, uh, infection of the lungs, and a syndrome called Leffler syndrome, which is a syndrome that affects the respiratory system. It can be caused by different triggers. One of the most popular trigger of Leffler syndrome is this uh, worm, the Ascaris worms. Worm burden means we have a lot of worms and the complications associated with that include intestinal blockage, biliary obstruction, obstruction of the biliary uh, uh, tract, pancreatitis, cholangitis, which is the uh, where the bile, where the bile comes from, cholestitis, gallbladder stones, malnutrition, following a lot of burden. This is this, this is especially common among children from developing areas. I'm going to show you a clip where you can see what it looks like. I'm going to be sharing my screen and show you what it looks like in surgery. If there are any children watching this, they may not you may not want them have them watch this specific video. I hope um, Simon, you're hearing me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. What are the chances of it going back to the first slide after this? Because that would be are we, are we are we taking a chance here? Uh, it's up to you. No, but do you think it'll continue from the last slide? Or will happen what happened last time? Because now we're well into the presentation, and, it, it, and we're taking a chance here. Well, it, I'm not exactly sure because I, I don't use this option very often. <clears throat> well, let's take a chance. And worst comes to worst, we'll run through the slides as fast as we can. Because it's a it's a striking video. It's worth seeing. So what we're seeing here, I'll, I'll, I'll talk in a second, is a surgery of somebody who was admitted to hospital with an enormous worm burden. In this type of, uh, in this amount of worms, you can't give the person a deworming medicine because they will all die at once and the person will die from obstruction. So they have to remove surgically. This is a very common uh, surgery. So you take the area affected with the worms, open it, and then start pulling them out. It takes a few hours sometimes. Get all the worms out. You can see they've already started before we got here. They have a whole bunch of worms in their plate already. And sometimes they'll just move them along in the intestine from place to place in order to get them all at the opening, in order not to open the intestine in several places. Sometimes you'll make another opening in the intestine to get a few more out. And once the vast majority are out, you never get them all out. Once the vast majority are out, resuture the 
the intestine, close the person up, and then give them after a few days of uh, of, of relaxation. There's a big bunch came out. Then you give them uh, anti-hormonic medicine like praziquantel or febendazole or whatever whatever is used in that in that community. And then the little, the few worms that are left will die and leave the body naturally. So I'm turning off my screen share, and we're going to go back to the present. Yay! All right, that was worth it. Okay. So food handling here, of course, is a whole different story because we're talking about a situation where it's just fecal oral. It's fecal oral. It's like it's like preventing shigella or hepatitis A or norovirus. It's uh, so. Um, symptomatic infections often associated with poor hygiene, ingestion of raw produce. In the environment, the over resistant to cold and common disinfectants, but sensitive to sunlight and temperatures above 45. So they are pretty resistant in the environment, but in very hot climates, if the food is out for a while, they'll die off, but they can still be on the produce, usually fruits and vegetables or in water. So in produce, the over can withstand disinfecting agents, which is a bad news. Also, acidity, freezing, and desiccation. So what we have to do is have to wash produce that's coming from areas where we suspect there may be ova. And by washing, it's not enough just to put the produce in a disinfecting solution. It has to be washed around and washed, like we will do with fruits and vegetables, mechanically removing dirt and debris and getting rid of these parasites that may be stuck on the produce on the outside, which makes it a, a challenge when we're talking about delicate fruits like berries, raspberries, um, um, fresh basil, that do not that they don't withstand robust washing. They're heat they're relatively heat stable, but if they're boiled, they will die. So cooking at 400 degrees and over, things that are boiled will kill them. But regular pasteurization, they may survive that. The eggs. And finally, I want to talk about a parasite that causes disease called cysteatricosis which has an enormous impact on public health. And what you're seeing here is a life cycle of two tapeworms. One is called Tinea solium, one is called Tinea saginata. Tinea solium is a pork human tapeworm. Tinea saginata is a cow human tapeworm. And the human is a part of the cycle, similar to what we saw with Diphilobrothrium latum with the fish tapeworm. So we have the animal, we have the human being. The animal, the human being swallows the larvae that are encysted in a cyst, in the meat. And they again, th then the scolex is released in the intestine. The scolex attaches itself to the intestinal wall, starts eating, feeding, and it grows its proglutids, the, the parts of the chain of the, of the, uh, of the tapeworm, the, the tape itself. And then the proglot seeds are excreted in the feces. The eggs are distributed in the environment, eaten by these animals who graze, and then the cycle continues. The disease caused in this case is called tineasis, and it is not a notable foodborne disease. The burden is not, it's not uh, substantial. A lot of people get these worms, they take a dewormer and they're fine. Like many tapeworms, like Cat tapeworms, like dog tapeworms, like other tape, tapeworms. The reason we're talking about, the reason it's, it's, it's worth mentioning is because, I just made this a little bit smaller, it's the same cycle, but now I've added on the cysticercosis cycle. In this case, the human being is the, is the pig. This happens only with the eggs of tinea solium. It doesn't happen with saginata. Only the pig tapeworm does this. And then human being eats the soil, not the pork. Okay, the, if we look at the previous slide, this you get from eating the pork. See, it's in the, in the missile. So if you eat pork or beef that hasn't been cooked well, you could get a beef or pork tapeworm, blah, blah, blah. To get cystic cirrhosis, you must eat the soil or the contaminated water or food that has been exposed to the feces, and it could be exposed to human feces. See, 
hoax was human feces. So in essence, this also is a fecal oral parasite that affects human beings, even though it's a, not it's zoonotic. So like Ascus lumbricoides, which is a fecal oral parasite, it's the same, it, we have the same cycle, but this is considered zoonotic because the presence of the pigs being infected also impacts. So if people don't get the disease, they won't have it in their poop, then other people won't eat it, they won't get cystic cirrhosis. So we do want to prevent teniasis from tenia solium by eating pork that's been cooked well and been treated in order to prevent other people from getting this complication with the cystic cirrhosis from eating human poop that's infected with the tape with the pork tape one. Because in this case, we are the pig, in essence, but as far as the worm is concerned. Of course, for the worm, this is unfortunate because nobody's going to eat us. So it's the end of the it's the end of the cycle for the worm. This is a again a tapeworm. It has a similar fate of the round worms we saw uh, the Ascaris, uh, the uh, Anasakis roundworm, which has an unfortunate fate if eaten by humans, and Trichinella, which is also not intended to be consumed by humans, and that's the end of its life cycle. So it's the same situation here. It's estimated that 70 million people are infested with tenia saginata, fibromyalgia solium. This is not the burden of cystic cirrhosis, but it does, the 5 million with tenia solium raise the the hazard, make it a, a more significant hazard. So we do want to fight this infection. Cystic cirrhosis, this is a recent study that was done in 2017 showing the global burden, the number of people infected to 100,000 in the population. So the dark red areas here in, in Central America, there is a over 500 people infected to 100,000 in population very high burdens parts of central africa and you'll see a lower burden in areas of south america and some other hot spots here that is the world burden but wherever it's you see it's not it's just like light yellow the rest of the world there are still cases there are cases worldwide it's not that they don't exist About 700 to 1,400 people die per year from cystic cirrhosis. We don't have an exact estimate because this is not a notifiable, it's not a notifiable disease, and it sometimes does go undetected, so we're not sure. The people who die from it will usually die from what we call neurocystic cirrhosis. In this case, the worms that that encapsulate themselves in the tissue will end up in the brain and there they'll cause disease. This is a photo from a surgery where this is in the brain. These are cysts and these are the worms released. It's not real. This is taken from Gray's Anatomy. Gray's Anatomy have a, one, of their, uh, one of their episodes deals with uh, the famous uh, Derek taking, uh, saving somebody from cysts in their brain. You can save these people, but most of them don't have the benefit of being operated on on TV by Derek, and they will die. Most tenias infections are subclinical. Symptomatic tenias, if there is symptomatic tenias, it's given such with nausea, vomiting, weight loss, diarrhea, like any other parasite. There are rare complications, appendicitis, cholangitis, pancreatitis, intestinal obstruction. These are rare complications of tenias. Cystic cirrhosis manifests as but 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 this what you can feel is a painless rubbery nodule on the skin or soft tissues, and often that's all you have. It depends where it where it just feels weird, and it can affect any area of the body. Neurocystic cirrhosis, where the brain is affected, then you have nerve, central nervous system infection, and that can present as seizures, increased intracranial pressure, uh, an altered mental status. Uh, meningitis, eosinophilic meningitis, was type of meningitis triggered by eosinophils, which are white blood cells that are common with parasitic infections. Focal neurological defect, depending on the exact location. This is a radiograph of a cyst in somebody's brain. Spinal cord mass, encephalitis, and so forth. And of course, there can be manifestations in other parts of the body. 
depending on where the cysts end up. The eyes are infested in 15 to 45% of patients. What you can see here is a little cyst in the eye with a little tiny worm in it. Pretty simple to handle if the ophthalmologist knows what they're doing very delicately. You pop the little cyst and pull the worm out. And usually there is no uh, long-term effect, but if it's not treated, it can cause blindness. Teniasis associated with consumption of uncooked pork or beef, that teniasis, cystic sarcosis associated with poor hygiene because it is a fecal parasite, proper disposal of human waste, good agricultural practices, proper handling of produce, same as Ascaris lumbricoides to prevent Ascariasis, but also we want to make sure as least as, as, as least number of people as possible get teniasis from teniasolium in order to reduce the number of people with cystic sarcosis. So I have four minutes left for questions. And I thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, <laughs> there have been uh, quite a few questions. Uh, do you, can you see this one, David, from yes. Ellie? Uh, from Eli, uh, Ellie, do you foresee the recent food trends such as ultra fresh, unprocessed foods to exacerbate the occurrence of foodborne worms in the population? The big drive for organic, unprocessed local market garden foods due to perception of ultra processed foods being bad for human diets and nutrition. Ellie, that's an excellent question. It has been discussed in various forums, and the general assumption is that even though there's a trend to fresher, less processed foods, there's also a higher awareness of hygiene and food handling pro uh, uh, practices that are sort of like a trade-off. So even though we see a trend in fresh foods and less processing, we still seeing a drop, uh, uh, a significant drop and a very uh, fortunate drop in these tropical exotic diseases from worms. So I don't think this uh, is going to be, if anything, it'll even make food safer because when we do consume fresh food like fresh fish or, uh, or less processed foods, then we're more careful with, the, with how we grow it. We're more careful how we slaughter it. We're more careful in the beginning. So, so I think there's a trade-off here, so I wouldn't worry about that. Okay, uh, Camilla, what are the health problems involved in a frozen fish where the worm is also frozen? None at all. Um, it's, uh, there, there has been concern in some very rare cases, and I'm, and I'm being careful, but very rarely, of an allergic reaction to a dead worm. Because if somebody's going to uh, react allergically to a worm, they will react to a dead worm. But this is so uncommon and so less common than being infected from the worm itself that it's not something to worry about. The only problem with freezing fish is organolectic. People can, people who are fish connoisseurs who like sushi, sashimi, can tell if the fish has been frozen. So there is a trend to not to use unfrozen fish. But it is a, an acceptable practice around the world for commercial fish that aren't going to be cooked to be frozen. And there's no problem eating frozen worms. That being said, it's worth mentioning that in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, where worms are not kosher, they are not acceptable even when they're dead, which is why that, move, that video I showed you of the removal of the worms was a workshop for ultra-Orthodox food handlers to remove worms for kosher reasons. Okay, thanks. Um, and then one from uh, Michael. Oh, sorry, I've lost that. Uh, get that back. Okay, what sorts of practices must be observed during the receiving inspection of fish and fish products for canteens at factories to prevent anisakis? Again, if uh, if the fish is going to be processed, then it's disregarded. We don't even think about it. If it's going to be cooked, it's like any practice of any parasite or, or, or contaminant that could be. If this fish is going to be used as fresh fish for sushi or for fresh other types of dishes, then it depends on where the fish is coming from. So usually the fish packing plant or processing plant where the fish is being bought from 
we'll have the screening and we'll do the testing and they'll and they'll have a health certificate a veterinary health certificate attached to the produce to the fish but if you're receiving fresh fish like salmon or and I will, well, fresh fish from the ocean then you might want to do the inspection yourself which requires a certain amount of knowledge you want to consult a veterinarian who can help you look how to identify in the fillets if there are in the fillet if there's any type of worms okay thanks david uh florin uh what about sea lice that we found frequently on the salmon skin is it dangerous i do not know i don't think so but i'm not sure i'm not familiar with that phenomenon all right uh minimum freezing temperature to kill worms Every type of worm and every type of food has a that you can find online uh, published and validated freezing tables showing the time and temperature. So the, the colder it is, you can do it for less time. So that's why I didn't give any numbers because it is, does change from product to product, but you can find these tables. We're talking about often, if you're not going to do a deep freeze, like minus 40, minus 30 Celsius, if you're doing a regular freeze in a, a minus 18, then you'll need days and days it'll take 20 30 days to make sure everybody's dead but if you have a deep freeze you can do it for less time but there are as i said and if somebody can't find that reference please write me an email and i'll 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 get the reference for you it's accessible okay jayan other than cooking and freezing it are there any other methods of controlling worms such as fermentation of meat or acidification not they, these other types of treatments have not been found to be effective. Uh, we've seen multiple cases in sausages that are fermented, large outbreaks of trichinella. So the answer is unfortunately no. Okay. To the best uh, of my uh, knowledge, to the best of my knowledge, there may be right. out there things people working on things that I'm not that I'm not aware of. I don't want to. So it's worth looking into right. further. Okay, and uh, CC, what is the effect of trichinella uh, of curing process? E example, Italian ham. Again, this would have to be looked on a case-to-case -case basis, seeing the amount of cure, the time involved, and it should be validated separately because, of course, there have been cases of trichinella from raw cured meat. It would depend on the cure. So I don't want to give an answer that's not, uh, that hasn't been validated. It would have to be looked at on a case-to-case -case basis. So, um, is blanching enough to kill the over? Blanching enough to kill over? It depends on whether the temperature is being 100 degrees, yes. But it depends on the temperature of the blanching. Um, okay. Um, Cam Camilla, can the cyst in the brain uh, encapsulate and no longer be life threatening? I guess so. Um, I, from what I understood, the people have been, they have found cysts in the brains of people on post-mortem that nobody knew about so it's a matter of luck so if if it's there nobody knows about it and it doesn't cause anything but sometimes people will be confused they'll have some kind of deficits and wonder what's happening on us upon ct then some then they'll identify if there's a little cyst and it depends where it's in, in the brain it'll cause that trouble sometimes the it's encapsulated and the and the effect is minor enough to not interfere Okay. Um, um, again, does cured pork pose a threat of parasites? Same answer. Yes. Yeah, the, yeah. But it depends on the amount of cure. It would have to be tested on a case to case basis. Yeah. I've just scrolled past uh, several comments saying there was uh, felt a bit sick, need to lie down <laughs> after that uh, <laughs> final uh, video. Um, Ellie, Eli, uh, agree, Jan Jackson, probably the best Food Safety Friday session seen. There you oh, go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, very interesting presentation. The last video was graphic. That was. I, I, I apologize, but, you know, we're all professionals, and uh, I apologize if it's yeah. that bad. But I did say take the kids away from the, from the screen. Yeah, so in the intestine there, they, they literally – thousands of, of worms i mean they, they could it, could it ultimately the person die with that because it's completely blocked isn't it it will cause yes it will the, the cause of death is obstruction and yeah. an obstructed bowel will cause death especially if the person if, understands that they have a high worm burden and somebody gives them an anti-worming medicine 
and then all the worms die at once, and then the person is in severe danger if they don't get the surgery quickly. So it's a it's a medical mistake to give deworming medicine for people who have a yeah. very high burden, especially of, of lumbricoides, of asperis, asperances. Right. And this is, and this happens in animals as well. I'm a veterinarian, and it, it, yeah. I don't I'm not a clinical veterinarian, but it does happen in animals as well that are mistreated and will die from worm obstruction and different types of different worms, not these ones. Okay, uh, you mentioned blanching uh, before, but minimum temperature for cooking to kill worms? Generally, uh, 85 degrees Celsius is, uh, but again, every worm has its own cooking tables, depending on the food, depending on how it's being cooked. And it, before putting together a process that is based on risk assessment, it should be validated per worm, and there are tables for that, like the freezing, as well for cooking. And, if, and these are accessible. I did not give these numbers intentionally in order not to, not for people not to cite me as being a validated decision and then using that, because it must be validated. So that's why I was careful not to give out any numbers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, I think that, but, that f Yeah, but definitely point. well done meat on a, on a barbecue of somebody's, because most of the cases of trichinella, which is the most hazardous worm out there, uh, are uh, game, hunted meat, people hunt meat, game, and they eat it and they don't cook it enough. So if you are into eating game, any type, it should be eaten, consumed, well done. And as long as it's well done, people will not get your vanilla. Okay. Uh, I think the final question there from Kate, Kaylin, Kaylin. Uh, oh, well, it was the final question. Um, where are we? Uh, if the infected fish is cooked instantly after purchase and it isn't frozen, will the parasites still survive and cause infection? If they're or killed on if they're killed on cooking, then they're killed. Uh, they're done. They won't uh, they won't come back to life and and um, and we're safe. But uh, cooking has to be done at an adequate temperature. Yeah, and in your experience, the uh, what what species of fish have greater incidence of worm reaching the retail market? Depending which worm. If we're talking about anasakiasis, um, a lot of uh, anchovy. There are a lot of anchovy cases in Portugal and Spain. Uh, a lot of cases of salmon and cod uh, from the northern areas. If we're talking about uh, Diphlebrophium latum, then of course freshwater fish, tilapia, uh, carp. Um, so that's not species specific and they can also be passed from marine life. So, uh, anisakis can also be passed on through squid, not only fish. Right. Brilliant. Right. Well, we've run a few minutes over, but, uh, well worth it. Thanks very much for your time today, David. Uh, thank you. And, and thank all of the people participating. It's really not, not obvious that people take time and, and, and sit in front of the computer and study and, and come to learn. And uh, chapeau to all of you for being enthusiastic about food safety and, and making the world a safer place. So thank you for that. Perfect. Thanks very much for your time, David. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Uh, that's David Rosenblatt. Superb presentation as usual from David. I've loaded your certificate of attendance in the sidebar. You can download that and um, print and sign it, or you can edit it in an image editing software and add your name that way. Okay, uh, have a nice weekend, everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.